All right, welcome back to Phlebotomy Solutions video presentation. Today we're going to be talking about important things to remember during a blood draw. Now we're going to be discussing this because there's a lot of things that go on during a blood draw that we kind of forget and we need to keep these things in mind whenever we are performing a blood draw and to be successful. So we're going to be talking about the seven uh, things that I think are the most important. Now some of these things you, you might want to watch some of the videos on. I've made um, separate videos for almost all seven of these uh, important things to remember. Uh, some of them are in my skills video. Some of them are down the line, uh, down at the bottom of my videos, so order of veins, order of draw, uh, hemo concentration, things like that. So I want to start with the, the top that I think are the top most important things to remember while you're performing a blood draw. So let's talk about this for a minute here. We want to talk about first the tourniquet. Let's talk about the tourniquet. The tourniquet's important because we got to keep in mind that we need to, uh, to keep the tourniquet three to four inches above the site. So from the antecubital fossa area where all four veins lie, or all, sorry, where all three veins lie, we have to make sure three to four inches. So it's technically right about midpoint of the bicep or on the middle. If we keep the tourniquet too close, let's say one to two inches above the site, we have a higher chance of causing a hematoma. The vein can collapse because the pressure is too close to the site and too close to the vein. So we gotta keep in mind, three to four inches above the site, we don't wanna cause restriction of blood flow, the blood flow to stop or else we won't be able to fill our tube, but we do wanna keep it to slow the, the blood flow down. So I keep slow, keep the tourniquet not too tight, but enough to slow restriction so the vein can distend up and we can, get a, we can feel it and locate the vein properly. Three to four inches, uh, make sure we keep it not too tight and then we want to make sure we, we keep that in mind Now I, I made a video on the tourniquet uh, Tying a tourniquet and the important things about it so you can watch that as well. Next is the alcohol is dry This is something that we forget to do when we wipe the alcohol from the center out We don't we don't rub it We wipe from the center out to keep it all clean and sterile as best we can uh, we want to make sure that the alcohol dries. The alcohol, if it's mixed with the blood and the additive in the tube because it's not dried, can cause the, the, the blood to uh, hemolyze. Uh, it can cause the test to be off or altered or no good, rejected by the lab. So we want to make sure uh, that the alcohol is dried completely as best as we can and avoid uh, you know hurting the patient because the needle goes in, the alcohol is there, it can sting the patient and hurt the patient, but most importantly, it can cause the specimen to be rejected. So let's make sure the alcohol is dried uh, and keep in mind the one the tourniquet one minute mark. Now, now the one minute on the tourniquet is, per, is key. I, I forgot to mention this. You got one minute with the tourniquet. The tourniquet needs to be on no longer than one minute because if you keep it longer than one minute, you have a higher chance of hemoconcentration setting in every 30 seconds and on, the percentage goes up and the test can be rejected or alter the levels of the result from too high or too low. So the tourniquet one minute, no longer than one minute. The alcohol is dried, make sure it's completely dried so we don't cause hemolyzed blood cells within the tube itself and that can cause the test to be rejected. Next to the order of veins. Uh, most people don't realize this, but there is a specific order to the veins. We look in the anocubital fossa area where all three veins lie. We look for the median cubital first, then the cephalic, and then the basilic. Those are the three major veins in that order, median cubital, cephalic, and basilic. The basilic is last because you have the brachial artery that runs just underneath it. We have nerves that run along that and we have a higher chance of hitting the artery or even nicking a nerve and causing damage. There have been legal cases where you know lawsuits have been put out because the, the phlebotomist ignored the other veins, went for the basilic, caused serious damage, and of course the, the patient won the suit because the, the, the phlebotomist failed to look at the more, uh, um, you know, the other veins that that are supposed to be looked at first, the median cubital cephalic. We, we look for the basilic last. If there's nothing on the hands, both arms don't show good veins, the basilic is always last. And we want them to keep note of that. So keep the order of veins. Again, I have a video on the order of veins. I go into great detail on this, so might want to watch that as well. Then, of course, proper needle and tube sizes. What does that mean? Well, for the needle gauges that we have, 21 and 23 gauge needles, we look at the adults. Uh, for a healthy adult, 21 gauge needle with large adult tubes uh, to vacuum out the blood. We want to make sure we, we keep the, the needle size and the tubes uh, accurately because if we use a 23 gauge needle, which is smaller, that we use on pediatrics or on geriatrics, uh, then we use a large tube that suction because the needle is smaller can suck the blood out harder and cause the vein to collapse, cause the hematoma, cause bruising, 
Uh, we, we won't get enough blood flow. The vacuum is too strong. We want to use small pediatric tubes with a 23 gauge needle. So whether we're drawing an elderly patient or a newborn and we use a 23 gauge needle, we use the small micro tubes, glass tubes to draw the blood. It's less vacuum and it won't collapse the vein. So proper needle and tube size needs to be understood before you draw the blood. What size needle do I use with what size tube? So keep that in mind. Also angle of insertion. Our angle is always 15 to 30 degrees when we do the antecubital fossa area. We don't go over 30 degrees and we want to keep it, we don't want to go below 15. Uh, so anything over 30 degrees is against CLSI standards and we can cause more harm to the patient. We can go through the vein, we can puncture an artery, we could uh, do damage to nerve because the angle is too steep and most likely we will collapse the vein and cause a hematoma, again bruising and we can cause a severe reaction to that. So we want to keep the needle at 15 to 30 degrees as CLSI standard. Uh, nothing more than 30, nothing less than 15, unless we're in the back of the hand, then we go 5 to 10. 5 to 10, 15 to 30. And that's textbook. So let's keep that in mind. Keep the angle of insertion always in mind. Again, tube tourniquet needle. This is the way we always properly do it in a textbook is we do the tube. We, we hit our last tube in, we're drawing blood. And before I pop the tourniquet, I take the last tube out, I invert it, set it down, pop the tourniquet. And then of course, uh, take my two by two, take my needle out. And as I go to cap my needle and move away from the arm, I cover the site and put pressure there. That's the way it's done. On my other videos, you can watch that. Uh, on my straight needle blood draw, I show that specifically in detail. You might want to go over that, but it's always the tube, tourniquet, and then needle as shown in the PowerPoint. So some people like to pop the tourniquet off too soon. They'll put the needle in and then they'll put the tube in or a tube and then they'll pop the tourniquet. And sometimes what happens is because that tourniquet might be helping the vein uh, with the vein restriction of blood flow, keep it keeping it uh, where the vein, the blood is slow. Sometimes when you pop it, uh, the vein might relax and then come out of the needle and then you have no more blood flow. So you could also stop blood flow by releasing the tourniquet too soon. It doesn't always happen, but it has happened. I, it's happened to me where I go in and I pop the tourniquet too soon and then blood flow stops and I don't have my tube filled and then it gets rejected by the lab. The only time you want to release the tourniquet before the tube comes out is if you're running over the one minute mark. So if I'm going past the one minute mark and I'm thinking, okay, I don't want hemo concentration, cause problems, then I pop the tourniquet off while I'm filling blood and I hope and pray that the blood keeps flowing into the tube. If it doesn't, I gotta start from that point on, redraw the patient with that tube that I, with a different tube and re redo it again. So always keep the tourniquet on until you pop the last tube, invert it, and then pop the tourniquet needle cover, of course, cap and dispose. Uh, again, only if you're over the one minute mark, do you want to keep that, you can pop the tourniquet off prior. Okay. Now the last thing is proper post-care instructions. This is what most phlebotomists fail to do. I guarantee you, if you ever had your blood drawn, you've never got post-care instructions, which means after I take the needle on, I put pressure, the patient can then hold pressure themselves with their thumb while I dispose of everything. I check my labels, do all that stuff. While they're holding, three to five minutes is the time frame. Three to five minutes is clotting factor time. Uh, actually, it's up to nine minutes. We do three to five. We check for hemostasis, which is blood control. Uh, if it's still bleeding, we keep another three to five minutes, which is now the clotting time up to nine to 10. And then we then look at it, no more blood. We bandage it up and we tell a patient, do not take it off for at least 15 minutes and do not lift anything for at least an hour. That's important because if they start lifting things right away, then it's going to open up the wound, cause blood to leak out under the tissue of the skin and cause a, hem uh, a hematoma, bruising, tenderness, swelling. And then if you didn't tell them, they're going to blame you because they think that you did the blood draw wrong when really you didn't tell them not to lift anything heavy for an hour. So it's important to tell them 15 minutes to keep the bandage on. Do not lift anything for over an hour. After you've kept pressure for three to five minutes, check for hemostasis hemostasis, make sure they understand the post-care instructions. That way they don't turn around and blame you for anything. Now, these are the seven things that I feel are the most important. Tourniquet, alcohol is dried, order of veins, proper needle and tube sizes, angle of insertion of needle and tube tourniquet needle and proper post-care instructions. These are, th these are the things that I've seen most phlebotomists fail to understand and fail to do in their blood draw. They'll at least uh, not do at least four or five of these things, maybe even sometimes all of them. Um, sometimes they're really good with the alcohol, the, the tourniquet, 
Uh, but sometimes the other things, they don't know the order of the veins. They don't know the uh, angle of insertion. They don't know about the tube tourniquet needle, the importance of that, or, or spe spe specifically post-care instructions. This is where I feel most phlebotomists fail. Uh, so keep these seven things in mind. These are key important things to remember. Uh, they'll help you become successful in every blood draw. And that way you won't ever, uh, you know, injure a patient, go against different uh, CLSI standards or CLIA, OSHA, HIP, a lot of these things. A lot of these things I have in other videos in more detail where I go through all these separately. Um, if you haven't watched them, please, after this, go back and watch those videos. Or if you have and you forgot some of these things, go back and review it. These are key things to help you become more of a successful phlebotomist in your blood draw. Now, with that, I want to thank you again for watching. Uh, you can visit our website, phlebotomysolutions.org. That's our telephone number if you have any questions regarding our website, products that we offer, uh, our practice exams, books, whatever questions you might have, you can call us anytime. But I want to say thank you for subscribing, watching, and if you like, share, like it, save it, and you can use this to help you become a better phlebotomist in the future. And I want to say thank you again for watching Phlebotomy Solutions, a video presentation. You have a great day and God bless.